Okay. So, as you know, this is about vaccinations. And I'm doing it a little bit differently than maybe some others you've seen, in that so often when people talk about vaccinations, they get into the science, how the immune system functions and how the vaccine's made up and all that stuff, which I think simply just gets you confused. You know, it's like the analogy I think of sometimes is some, somebody shows up from the past, time travels, and for the first time they see a car and they say, what, what is that? Mm -hmm. And you start explaining to them about the pistons and the valves and the, how the brakes work and everything. All they want to know is that there's somebody who gets in it and moves, right? So <clears throat> I'm not going to go into all about the immune system and everything um, because the, I think the question here to focus on is um, an evaluation of vaccination as a process. I don't mean this current vaccination, mm -hmm. vaccination across the board. So we're going to start with the beginning, how it began, which is with smallpox. I'm, to, I'm only going to talk about three uh, diseases, um, um, smallpox and polio and measles a little bit, because those are the ones you know most about. And mm -hmm. it, it's all pretty much the same story mm -hmm. with all the different vaccines. But it's very interesting to know about the beginning of vaccination, what, what supposed science or evidence is there. It's very informative. But it's also upsetting to hear something like this because, first of all, the disease is very frightening. You can see why people were really, you know, looking desperately for anything that would work. Um, so that's one thing. It's, it's, it's not nice to hear about about the disease. We're not going to focus a lot on that, but still, you, I'll show you some pictures. The other thing is, um, it's upsetting. You can even become angry when you find out some of the dishonesty that was done in bringing this out and promoting it. And then the third thing is, that some people feel very much believe in it, and they don't want it challenged. They don't want anybody to say, oh, you're making it up. It's you know, you're not telling the truth and so on. So those are all things that can come up for you. I'm just going to present to you what I know from the history. I didn't make this up, just what's in the books and so on. And so I think well, the first one with smallpox is the one to focus on the most because it, it is, um, as I say, the beginning and, and uh, also the, <clears throat> interestingly, as we go through these, these um, histories, how much it's like today. That's what's surprising. This is two centuries ago. Mm -hmm. All right. So smallpox was called small to differentiate from syphilis, which was called great pox. And syphilis was a very scary disease. It'd be interesting to go into that sometime, but we won't. Uh, syph syphilis spread over the, it was an epidemic. I'll just say one little thing about it. It's interesting. It came from the New World, you know, from the Indians, apparently. And when it hit Europe and it spread like an epidemic, um, one of the very common things that happened if you had syphilis was your hair fell out. Mm -hmm. And that's why they started wearing wigs. Oh, really? That's where the practice of wigs began. Oh, wow. Because people didn't want to, to be obvious that they didn't have any hair in their head. Oh. So they developed a cultural pattern of wearing wigs. Interesting, huh? Mm. Yeah. Okay, so this is called smallpox. You can see what it looks like. This is a pretty bad case here. This fellow in bed, you see it covers his entire body, the eruption. It's a skin disease. All viruses have a predilection for a particular part of the body. Some want to go to the lungs, some want to go to the intestines, and so on. And smallpox, like some other diseases, wants to go to the skin. And then from there it spreads, of course, from the discharge that's in the scabs or whatever. I'll, and I'll make it more clear. But this gives you an idea. Another thing about it is that um, the mortality rate well, could be as high as 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent, um, which is not super high compared to the Black Deaths and things like that, but it's pretty high compared to the flu, which we're dealing with now. Uh, and oftentimes, death would occur in two to five days after the rash appeared. Mm -hmm. I was just telling Richard this morning that my grandfather lost his brother to mm -hmm. smallpox. I don't know if any of you have had that in your family history, if you're not. Mm -hmm. A lot of people died from it. 
significant numbers, you know, that's why, that's why it's a scary disease, why people want to do something about it. Now, the next one I'm going to show you is smallpox almost always affected the face, and that was very alarming, too. Mm, so you see yeah. how this woman now, her whole face is covered with it. And the thing is that if she lived through it, the pox marks would stay on her face her whole life, permanently yeah. disfigured. Yeah. Not so nice. Yeah. So a little bit of briefly history here. They don't know when it started. There's some suggestion it started in the eastern part of the world, but that may be the western world, blaming them. Uh, they thought to maybe start in India, but nobody really knows for sure. Um, it had been observed for se several centuries by the time we get to the vaccination mm -hmm. development. So it had been around, had a long history. Um, it only affects human beings as far as it's known. It doesn't affect animals. It's what the scientists say. And there are two forms. Uh, it's called variola, major variola and minor variola. It's usually the major one that's in the epidemics. That's why these the pictures are scary because that's the way it, it often appears. But there is a minor form that occurs sometimes. By the 1700s, it had been learned by observation that if a person had it and recovered, they usually didn't get it again. They just observed that immunity. They didn't call it that, but they observed that that's the way it was. So, um, so it was thought, the, wi the wisest thing they thought to do was to let it run its course, just try to take care of the person as best you could and help them recover, yeah. which made sense, you know, because you figure, well, after that, they won't get it again. <laughs> was it highly contagious? It was contagious, yes, mm -hmm. through the material from the skin. Not so much from the breath and other things, but more the discharges from the skin, the matter material. There was pus underneath the scabs. So it, then a new idea emerged. Why not get it on purpose and be done with it? Mm -hmm. Right? If you're going to have to get it. So the next step was called variolation. Have any ever heard of that? No. This was before vaccination. This is the first step. I think it came from China, but I'm not certain about that. But variolation was where a person would take some of the matter from underneath the poxes that appeared, and a uh, person with the smallpox, and then make a little cut and put it in the person's arm, rub it in. And that, was, uh, that was, uh, became a, a rather common practice. The idea being, well, we'll, we'll try to make it safe as possible. So did they get smallpox? Well, we'll see here. Oh. It was done primarily in the upper and middle classes that could afford to do this. It sometimes worked, or apparently or worked in the sense that they didn't get smallpox, but sometimes they did get smallpox, oh. and then they could die from it. So it was real tricky, okay? <laughs> now, when I say sometimes it worked, I'm just I'm using that phrase, which may not be accurate. It could just simply be they weren't susceptible. Mm. Okay, that, that, that's something to point out. In any, even the Black Death, the devastated Europe, 50% of the people were not affected by it. Mm -hmm. So it depends on susceptibility, which could be another topic in itself, mm -hmm. all right? Um, now, I want, another thing I want to emphasize is, I think it's a very, uh, to me, it's a very, very important point. I'd love for you to understand and agree with me. <laughs> Everything we do, all our actions, including a cultural action like this, has a base foundational idea. There's always some idea at the bottom, right? You understand? Mm -hmm. Now, you could, if I ask you, what is the idea here for them doing this? Well, you could say, oh, because it's a way of, you know, getting it in a mild form, it's a way of getting immune, blah, blah, blah. But what I want to point out to you, the assumption that, that at the bottom is that they have no choice but to get it. Mm. The idea is I cannot escape it. I'm a victim. Mm. I'm going to get it. So I'm going to find some way to do it as mildly as possible. You understand? That's what underlies vaccination protocols today. Mm. You see? So 
<clears throat> variolation also tended to be followed by health problems. Many people had chronic, persistent health problems, not surprisingly, mm -hmm. even if they didn't die from it. <clears throat> Parents often did this with their children. This is really kind of shocking here. They often did it with their children. They harvest the material from what they considered to be a healthy, they pick out a healthy person with smallpox, whatever that was, yeah. and get the material from them and transfer it to their child. Before the child was inoculated, it was for several weeks prepared by repeated bleeding, where the doctor would take blood from their body in pints, and then uh, purging, which is where you use drugs to cause diarrhea, yeah. and then depriving them of food until they were almost a skeleton. Mm -hmm. This was standard practice. Mm -hmm. So you bring the child into this state, and then you give them the smallpox. Now, I don't have no idea why they came up with this, but they must have thought it somehow was a favorable thing to do. But can you imagine doing that to your child? Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable, isn't it, that what we are willing to take on out of fear. Mm -hmm. Probably quite a few. <clears throat> now we come to vaccination. That was the next step after variolation. Historically, the first person was Benjamin Jesty in England, who was a dairy farmer. And you see the dates here, 1736 to 1816 was when he lived. He was the one that first suggests, because he's a dairy farmer, that the, the women that milked the cows, the dairy maids, so-called, he didn't think they got the smallpox because they got protected by being exposed to cowpox, which is a similar virus, not the same, but it looks kind of like it, you know, an eruption on the cow. So that was his idea. So he started doing a thing where he would take the matter from the cowpox from the cow and rub it into scratches on the arm of his wife and two children with a darning needle. Well, 20 years later, Edward Jenner, who was a doctor, they, they refer to him in today's writings as doctor. At that time, there weren't really doctors like we think of doctors. They were either, they were usually a barber and a podiatrist, or a barber and something. That's usually what doctors were, as barbers now. We don't, we think barbers cut hair, but at that time they did all sorts of things like bleeding and mm -hmm. surgeries and so on. So he suggested the same idea in 1796, you see, so that was later. He thought that the same thing, that if the dairy maids got the cowpox, it was a mild disease and they were protected. That was his idea. Maybe he got it from Jester. I, I didn't see any confirmation of that, but it, I wouldn't be surprised that he picked it up. So he experimented. Again, this is another thing hard to believe. He experimented on young children. So on the 14th of May, 1796, he vaccinated... James Phipps, he, a little boy, eight years old, was the son of his gardener. The gardener had no choice about it. He was to keep his job. And he took the matter from the hand of a dairy maid that had cowpox, and he scratched the arm, I guess it was probably, and got, got it into the boy to supposedly inoculate him. After six weeks, if you can believe it, he injected both arms, the boy with smallpox. Can you imagine? Right, Adrian, you have some guy working for you, and you take his son and you do this thing and then say, okay, now we're gonna test him and I give him smallpox. <laughs> Unbelievable, isn't it? Well, the boy lived. He had a rough few days. Jenner's notes describe nine days of fever and aches, much milder than smallpox, but no picnic. Mm. But the boy didn't die. Several months later, he was again injected with smallpox pus. <laughs> and according to Jenner, he was artificially exposed to the disease a second time and no effect was produced. Believe it or not, on the strength of this one experiment, And his questionable interpretation, Jenner based his claim that one vaccination would, quote, forever secure a person from smallpox. Mm. Mm. One experiment. Mm. Mm. Amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Convinced of the virtue of the vaccination that he did, 
he inoculated his 18-month-old son, Robert, with smallpox, or swinepox, rather, which is a similar disease, similar virus, apparently, in 1791, and again in April 1798, with, then with cowpox. So he did it to his own son, too. Robert, his son, died of tuberculosis at the age of 21. James Phipps died of tuberculosis at the age of 20. Now, a lot of people would see this and say it had nothing to do with the vaccination, right? They deny it. But did the vaccination lower their resistance? Did it make them more susceptible? You see, that's a good question, isn't it? I'm not saying it did. We can't be certain about it. But it is something to consider. And interestingly enough, if you read about Jenner's work, in almost any book where it talks about Jenner testing it and so on, they almost never mention that his son died when he was 21 and his other 20, nothing. Anyway, just throwing the question out for consideration. Mm. However, other doctors reported that milkmaids were not immune as time went on. And they observed them also susceptible to the disease. So, Jenner wrote that he agreed. There were many examples of milkmaids exposed. Uh, even though they were exposed to the cowpox, they still got spot. He agreed finally, okay, you know, I, I see that that happens. So he kind of backed off a little bit, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He changed his method to using horse grease instead of cowpox. It's said to be today's science thinks it's the same virus that cows and horses. It affects the horse's feet. They use this greasy, offensive material. So he changed to using that instead. I don't know why. I haven't seen any explanation of it. Fox from the same cow and injected into children. Oh my God. He's crazy good. <laughs> All attempts to verify this by other doctors ended in failure. You see that as we're going through this, there isn't really good evidence that his methods worked. Mm -hmm. You see that? Mm -hmm. The public didn't like, didn't like his new plan because the, the horse disease was oily and disgusting. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Nevertheless, in 1806, Another doctor, Dr. Robert Willen, published a monograph entitled Vaccine Inoculation, in which he cites Jenner's work, doesn't mention horse grease in it, just Jenner's work, and his publication made the claim that cowpox was a, quote, true prophylactic. Why he came up with this? No explanation. But you see, what, what I'm suggesting, as I did earlier, fear drives this. People want a solution, desperately. Mm -hmm. And so when you put out something like this, like in today's world, mm -hmm. oh, this will help you. People just swallow it, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that from what we've gone through already, there was very little evidence that Jenner's plan really worked very well. And, and yet, nonetheless, this doctor claimed it did, and it turned around. The horse grease part was, was not put in the monograph, it was just ignored. Mm. Jenner agreed to just promote cowpox. In 1802 and 1807, Jenner applied and received large sums of money from the House of Congress to promote vaccine programs. Mm. The first ones. Mm. Right, over 200 years ago. <laughs> On the basis of what we've gone through so far, he wants to now inoculate large populations. He claimed it was very beneficial and made the person, quote, perfectly secure. Mm -hmm. So inoculation programs were started. <clears throat> What's the date for that? 1807. 1807, yeah, mm -hmm. or thereabouts, within a year or two. Soon there were reports of smallpox in the vaccinated. They'd be vaccinated, then they get smallpox. Mm. All right? This was, of course, denied by the medical profession. Mm. Oh, no, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. All right. 
The next thing is, when they could no longer deny it, too many cases and too severe, they just couldn't ignore it anymore, they now said it, if the vaccination did, did not prevent the disease, it made it milder. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything like yeah. that? <laughs> Can you believe that 200 years ago, they're coming up with the same yeah. explanations? Wow. Same playbook. Same playbook. Mm -hmm. Then they started to see deaths in the vaccinated dying after the vaccine. Mm. 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 So the next explanation now, if you can believe this, I know this is kind of crazy, hard to follow. The next explanation now was that vaccinated people who got smallpox and recovered, if they, if they were vaccinated, got smallpox, and then recovered from smallpox, it really was smallpox, and the vaccine was effective. If they got smallpox and died, then it wasn't smallpox. <laughs> it was another disease called spurious cowpox. <laughs> oh, my God. So that's what the records will show. If they're vaccinated and died, they had a different disease, not smallpox. You see how it can begin to look like you know, the records can indicate that the vaccine was really effective. You see how, wouldn't they do it this way? <clears throat> when Jenner died in 1823, three kinds of vaccination were in use. Cowpox, which is the pure limb from a calf affected by it. Horse grease, the true, quote, the true and genuine life-preserving fluid. <laughs> And horse grease, cowpox, Jenner's later formula, those three were being used, okay? All resulted in suffering and death. When the vaccine programs were not effective, then revaccination was promoted to receive repeated injections instead of one. Sound familiar? When the doctors finally admitted that one didn't work, let's repeat them. Mm. I saw today a headline, some medical authority saying we're going to have to get a vaccine every year. Wow. Hospital records were doctored in this way. <laughs> it's a funny word, doctored. So here, this, this is important to understand. This is how they, they made record of the illnesses and people that were vaccinated. If they were vaccinated and died of smallpox, they were registered as unvaccinated in the records. Wow. They were vaccinated, they got smallpox and they died. The records indicate they were unvaccinated. Oh, it's like wow. it's life. Yes, absolutely false. And what they meant by that was that the vaccine didn't take probably. Mm -hmm. All cases of smallpox after vaccination were instead diagnosed as pustular eczema or some other disease, but mm -hmm. not smallpox. They changed the diagnosis. Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's amazing, isn't it? Were they yeah. making a lot of money off of this? Well, <laughs> is, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> How do you think Bruce Jenner would afford his secretary? <laughs> 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 Before England, before England passed a mandatory revaccination, rather vaccination law in 1853, the highest death rate from smallpox in any two-year period up to that time was only 2,000 cases in two years. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. History until that time, every two years there were 2,000 cases of death. Between 1870 and 1872, after more than 15 years of mandatory shots, nearly 45,000 people died from the disease wow. Wow. in two years. So we went from 2,000 to 45,000 after mandatory vaccination. Mm. Do you think this might be relevant yes. to consider? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Same results in Germany, Japan, and many other countries. We'll get into Germany in a bit here. One of the worst smallpox epidemics of all time took place in England between 1870 and 1872, nearly two decades after compulsory vaccination was introduced. So they're being vaccinated every year. 
after this evidence that smallpox vaccination didn't work, the people of Leicester in the English Midlands refused to have the vaccine anymore. Mm -hmm. They revolted. Mm -hmm. When the next smallpox epidemic struck in the early 1890s, the people of Leicester <coughs> relied upon good sanitation and a system of quarantine. Mm -hmm. They had one death during that epidemic oh. in Leicester, one death. Whereas all the other towns had many, many, many deaths of smallpox. Mm -hmm. Good comparison, huh? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, here's a little table showing the relationship between um, when um, the, historically, when the shots were refused in England and Wales. See, here's a 10 year, these are 10 year periods here. And over here is the percent of babies vaccinated in the population. And these are the smallpox deaths per million. Now, you'll see in 1881, at the top, not, almost 97% of the babies were vaccinated, and there were over 3,700 smallpox deaths. Mm. Ten years later, it was 82% of the babies were vaccinated, and it dropped to 933. Mm. Another 10 years, went down to 68% of the babies vaccinated, and dropped to 437 deaths. Mm. You see the relationship? Mm. Uh, the next year, 10 year was about the same, around 68 again, and it's, it dropped a little bit from 437 to 395, but not a whole lot of difference. <clears throat> the next one, 1921, <coughs> dropped to 42% of the babies vaccinated. It dropped to 12 deaths. And then 1931, it stayed about the same, 43%, drifted around to 25, so that was about the same. Yes? The objection could be made the correlation isn't causality. That, of course. That they, you know, that they vaccinated less because it was already going down. Yes. That's right. These are all good questions. And the last one, 1941, about 40% vaccinated, they had one death. It's just interesting to see the chart, to see the suggestion that maybe less vaccination, because this is what a lot of countries reported that once they stopped vaccinating, the smallpox incidence went down historically. I'm just giving you certain parts of it. There's a lot of literature out there about this, a lot of detail. So I'm just generalizing. In Germany, in the years 1870 to 71, smallpox was rampant in Germany. Over 1 million persons had the disease and 120,000 died. That's a lot, isn't it? 96% of these had been vaccinated. Wow. 96% of the, of the 1 million had been vaccinated, and they got smallpox. Mm. Bismarck, who was the chancellor of Germany, addressing the governments of various German states, quote, said, the hopes placed in the efficacy of the cowpox virus as preventive of smallpox have proved entirely deceptive. Mm. Interesting, huh? Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about eradication, which is what's claimed. Mm -hmm. By 1972, the report was there was no smallpox in South America now. By 1974, that it, was only, it was only in India, the only place in the world. The last case of normal transmission was supposed to be in Bangladesh, 1975. And then the Global Commission for the Eradication of Smallpox in 1979 said, it had been eradicated, quote, one of the greatest triumphs of scientific knowledge <laughs> and public health practice in history. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, people will argue that it did eradicate it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But just keep in mind mm -hmm. all of this information. So is that true? Doctors and drug companies may not like it, but the truth is, um, and, and uh, this is what, if you study epidemiology, study of epidemics and public health, and I, I taught that in the, at Washington State University, for that's how I learned some of this stuff, that the records indicate most, most people at the, uh, have attributed the decline in infectious disease due to um, sanitation, better living conditions, and quarantine of patients that were sick and so on. Uh, I just briefly mentioned to you, so you probably know, but back early on in history, before our modern times, 
when people congregated in towns, they didn't have all the facilities we had. They didn't have indoor toilets. <clears throat> they, they had a, a, a public water pump somewhere in the center of the village. <clears throat> and anything, any poop or pee or other stuff, vomit, was just thrown in the street. That was standard practice. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, were washed down into the water, and you know. So, so that all, as that changed, they began to develop chlorinated water and, they, and, and purified, pure water coming in and sewage and all that stuff, then diseases diminished. That's what they found out in that setting epidemic. When the World Health Organization campaign <clears throat> to rid the world of smallpox was at its height, the number of cases of smallpox went up each time there was a large scale and expensive mass vaccination hmm. and in susceptible countries. As a result of this, the World Health Organization changed its strategy. Mass vaccination programs were abandoned and replaced with surveillance, isolation, and quarantine. Okay, that's just a reference there. Um, one more case of smallpox was reported in Birmingham, England in 1978. The virus escaped from a medical lab. A young woman died and her mother was sick, yet recovered. The director of the laboratory committed suicide. There are two stocks of smallpox virus left in the world. One, it's frozen in liquid nitrogen. One is in Atlanta, Georgia, and the other is in Koltsovo, Siberia, in the Russian Federation. And they are kept there in case smallpox should ever be used as a biological weapon that they will now come out with a vaccine again. Okay. That's the idea. All right, so let's switch over to polio. <clears throat> if there's no questions at this point. Okay. Similar story. <clears throat> I, that was one of the ones I got when I was younger, probably most of you too. That was one of the, after the childhood vaccines, that was the next one that came along. Mm -hmm. And so this is very interesting here. This is the death rate of polio over a period of time, and it goes from about 1920 to 1970. And the two lines here, the red line is the death rate in, in the United States, and the yellow line is the death rate in Great Britain. So it starts here at zero. I don't know what number they started with, but at zero in the early 1920s, it started with the death rate of how many people were dying at that time from polio. The reason they use death rate it's considered more reliable. If it's based on diagnosis, we already see how they play with that. Death was not was not so easily, it could be altered. It certainly has been done, but it's just usually more obvious. They're paralyzed, they had the symptoms and they die. So it's usually more obvious. So that's why they use death rates as a way to evaluate these things in ep ep epidemiology. So you can see Starting with early 1920s, uh, you know, here by 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960, you can see a steady decline in the death rate both in the U.S. and Great Britain, right? You see that? You understand that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this, I'm saying to you, was because of sanitation and other practices like that. <clears throat> okay, so then... Polio vaccines were introduced. Now, if you probably have heard, people will say polio is one of the most amazing thing that medicine developed. It just like totally stopped epidemics and blah, blah, blah. You've heard all that kind of language? Yeah. Okay, look here. Here's the first one that was given. No noticeable effect. Mm -hmm. That's a sock vaccine, 1950s, middle 50s. Sock vaccine was the first one, the dead, so-called dead virus. And here's the Sabin, live virus. No noticeable effect from using it in the incidence of deaths from polio. Isn't that interesting? Instead of what you'd expect from what you're told is it's introduced and it drops. You don't see anything like that. But it's already dropped. There's no change in the... So, doctors and scientists on the staff of the National Institute of Health during the 1950s, that's when the first one was introduced, 
were well aware that the sock vaccines were ineffective and deadly. Oh, dear. Some frankly stated that it was, quote, worthless as a preventive and dangerous to take. They refused to vaccinate their own children. Sock was quoted himself as saying, when you vaccinate children with a polio vaccine, you don't sleep well for two or three weeks. Oh. Scary. Oh. He knew. When they gave me the shot, I fainted. No. Yes. And, and mm-hmm. then I think it was Judy Mikovich who, who talked about the, the um, cancer-causing monkey virus. That was in the Sabin, the Sab- uh, uh, Simeon Virus 40. Mm-hmm. It, just to briefly explain, that was a live virus. It was cultured in, in monkey cells. That's how they grew the virus to alter it. They altered the virus, supposedly won't cause the disease, just make you immune. They didn't know there was a monkey virus in there as well. And they vaccinated millions of people with it. And the thing that's significant about it is it had already been shown that simian virus 40 could cause cancer in animals. But if you go in and you study the history of cancer treatment, almost nobody ever refers back to that as being a factor. And yet millions of people are vaccinated with a virus that causes cancer in animals. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So you know the trick is you just ignore what you don't want to, you don't like. Simple, huh? All right. So nonetheless, the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis and pharmaceutical companies with a large investment in the vaccine, like Park Davis, coerced the United States Public Health Service into signing a false proclamation claiming the vaccine was safe and 100% effective. Wow. Yeah. Okay, this one's a little bit more complicated, so, but it's very important. So bear with me here. The, what this shows here is how polio was diagnosed before and after the vaccine was introduced. Okay, so over here on this side is before the vaccine was introduced and over here was after the vaccine was introduced. Okay, you follow me? Okay, so this was the number, the the green one here, the green one here is diagnosed uh, cases of polio. The little yellow guy down here is what they call aseptic meningitis. Meningitis is inflammation of the lining of the spinal cord, which is what polio causes. It's the same thing. Polio causes inflammation of the spinal cord. That's why there's paralysis. So the only difference is the words you used. When they say aseptic, that meant there was no virus that caused it. All right? So they had two diagnostic categories, you understand? The doctor could, when you had the symptoms, the doctor could say, well, you had polio or you had aseptic meningitis. Mm. And that, this was the, whoops. This was the incidence here before the vaccine. You see how much polio was diagnosed here, right? Mm-hmm. This is after the vaccine was introduced. Mm-hmm. The incidence had dropped of so-called polio to 50 and aseptic meningitis jumped up to 256. So the same kind of total number of cases, except if you add those together here, probably there's more of these. You see what they did? They did the switcheroo? Mm -hmm. Changed the diagnosis. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's how they changed the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Before the vaccine was introduced, to have an epidemic of polio, you had to have 20 cases per 100,000 population. After the polio vaccine was used, it had to be 35 cases per 100,000. So now we defined epidemics differently. Mm. After the vaccine, there were fewer epidemics. Because before you'd have 20, now you have to have 35. Mm. And before the vaccine was used, to have the diagnosis of polio from a doctor, the doctor had to examine you and, and, and note that you'd been paralyzed for 24 hours. That's how the diagnosis of polio was made. 
after you had to be paralyzed for 60 days and two different doctor appointments confirming it. So we went from 24 hours to 60 days. Can you understand now why the, the diagnosis of polio diminished? Because they cheated. They cheated. And that's what they're doing today. They've changed the parameters. They've changed the parameters now since Biden was elected. They've now changed the, the test to have fewer replications. So now it'll look like there's fewer cases. Mm -hmm. It's the same pattern mm -hmm. 200 years ago, still running in our heads. Mm -hmm. In Europe, when the sock vaccine became available, many European countries questioned its effectiveness and refused to systematically inoculate their citizens. Yet polio epidemics also ended in those countries without any vaccination programs. After the mass inoculations, and going back to the U.S., <clears throat> Vermont reported 15 cases during the one-year period before the mass inoculations were started, 15 cases of polio, and compared to 55 cases a year after the inoculations were begun. Mm -hmm. It went from 15 to 55 cases. Mm. Rhode Island went from 22 cases to 122, an increase of 454%. New Hampshire went from 38 to 129. Connecticut went from 144 to 276 cases. And Massachusetts was 273 before, and 2027 after an increase of 642%. Aren't the inoculations wonderful? Oh, what a gift. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> According to CDC figures, 87% of all cases of polio in the U.S. between 1973 and 1983 were caused by the vaccine. Recently, from 1980 through 1989, every case of polio in the U.S. was caused by the vaccine. Three of the five people who contracted polio during foreign travel were previously vaccinated. And this is from this reference here. <clears throat> we don't have to go into, but it's from a CDC reference. Mm. So <clears throat> here's a chart showing what we just went through, showing the different New England states. And you can see here the orange is before the mass inoculations and the blue is after. It, it really gives you a visual picture of what it looks like. You can see how, mm. what the effect of the inoculations was, right? Okay, we're almost done. We're done to measles. Uh, another example of this, <clears throat> similar chart here, you see, this is from uh, 1910 down to 1970, approximately, and you see, again, the United States and England declined, starting up here at zero, uh, and then the de percent of decrease of deaths. When do you think the measles vaccine was given? The slide shows the measles death rate decreased by 95% before the vaccine was introduced. Mm -hmm. This is from the um, International Mortality Statistics, Washington, D.C. That would be so easy to lie with that and just look at the first figures and say, well, before that we had X, Y, Z, and then mm -hmm. after it was like it was much smaller. Yeah, exactly. And here's a little pie chart showing uh, children with measles. This is in 1984. All, this pie chart represents all of the cases of, of measles that year. And it shows here that this orange part of the pie is the vaccinated children, 58% of them. And the blue part are the ones that weren't vaccinated, 42%. So we can't say for sure the vaccines really made a difference, but it's obvious that the, over half of them were vaccinated that had measles during that year. <clears throat> According to a study conducted by the World Health Organization, chances are about 14 times greater that measles will be contracted by those vaccinated against the disease than by those who are left alone. 
Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Dr. Atkinson of the CDC said, quote, measles transmission has been clearly documented among vaccinated persons. In some, in some large outbreaks, <clears throat> over 95% of cases have a history of vaccination. More recent outbreaks continue to occur throughout the country, sometimes among 100% vaccinated populations. Now, one little short thing here to finish up. I'm going to talk about the vaccinosis. Many of you don't know what that means. <clears throat> it was a, a term that was coined in homeopathic medicine <clears throat> because homeopathy started 200 years ago, so it was during this period that there were practitioners. <clears throat> and it was discovered by, I'm sure by more than one person, but the one I'm going to mention was one that more brought out information about it in England, where it was recognized of the, the persistent and chronic diseases that came on after being vaccinated. So in other words, we're not now talking about being vaccinated and then getting measles or getting polio. <clears throat> we're talking about being vaccinated and having a health problem thereafter. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he the term he used was vaccinosis. Mm -hmm. So this was a fellow here, J. Compton Burnett, 1984. 1884. Oh, excuse me, 18, <laughs> 1884. <You're> time <laughs> I'm back. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly, the effects could last very long. So here's an example case from him. There's a lot of cases, but I'll just give you a couple of one of his cases was a 50-year-old woman who had suffered for 20 years with eye pain. The severe pain confined her to her bed for days and as long as six weeks at a time. She was confined to a dark room, her head bound with bandage and crying from the pain for six weeks. For 20 years. Wow. <clears throat> And the attacks were always preceded by flu-like flu -like symptoms. She spent a half of every year in bed. Wow. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. She had been vaccinated for smallpox several times. And so Dr. Jenner recognized that was the problem. He used a homeopathic remedy that's used to antidote vaccines called Thuya. It's made from a plant, Thuya oxidant house. Dr. Hmm? Burnett, you said Dr. Jenner. Oh, excuse me. Dr. Burnett. Dr. Burnett recognized that this particular medicine would resolve the problem, the resulting from smallpox. He'd, mm -hmm. he'd figured that out. Mm -hmm. And he used that homeopathic remedy, treated her with that, and after 20 years, she was cured in six weeks. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that homeopathic? Thuya. 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 Or it's often spelled T H U J A, really, is proper spelling. Thuya. Oxidant Dallas, it's Arborvitae plant. There's some of them in people's yards around here. Yeah, it's not an unusual plant at all. I wonder if that would help the people getting things done now. Maybe. There's other, there's other ones that have been discovered since then that are important. There's a number of them. There's probably, I would guess there's 20 or 30 different homeopathic remedies now that are known because there's no more vaccines and there's different... You see, but this is really an important one. This is a biggie still today, so it could be. She remained free of any symptoms for the next year. Impressive, huh? Mm -hmm. She'd been ill for 20 years, and Dr. Burnett realized the importance of the remedy through you for treating vaccinosis. One more case. This is a woman, a young woman, 19 years old, had suffered severe headaches for nine years. The pain felt like the back of her head was being squeezed in a vice with throbbing as like it was going to burst open. These attacks occurred once or twice every week for nine years. Mm -hmm. Could I pay any of you enough to go through this for nine years? Mm -hmm. How about a million dollars a month? Would you do it? <laughs> no. No. Terrible, isn't it? Some of the other symptoms she had was habitual constipation, poor appetite, tendency towards styes in her eyes, little abscesses in her eyelids, eruption of boils, cold feet, easily made motion sick, motion sickness, tendency to faint, skin sensitive to wind and becomes rough and her lips would crack. These are all symptoms that she had besides the headache. 
She'd been vaccinated for smallpox several times at three months of age, at seven years of age, and she got actually smallpox when she was 10. And she was vaccinated again at 14 years of age. What the hell? My work this time. She was treated with homeopathy, with Thuya again, after over several months and was cured. She remained free of illness and symptoms during two years he followed up with her. It's impressive, isn't it, to have a headache for nine years and then be cured and for two years be free of it. That's what makes homeopathy so amazing as a system. When you start seeing these results, oh my God, how could that happen, you know? Something that bad, that persistent, and then resolved with one medicine. Okay. That's it. Any, any questions? Any new stuff on the new one? No, I didn't do anything on the new one. Okay. It's going to be the same story. Mm -hmm. wow. Externally, but in terms of the, the symptoms and everything, it's such a different vaccine. Oh, yeah, yeah. It could be different symptoms entirely. Mm -hmm. It's not really a vaccine. It's something totally different. Mm -hmm. but the point is, I would say to you, I'll just give you my perspective. Going back to the beginning here, the foundation of all of this is fear that you are a victim and, and you cannot escape it. It's, a, it's a, a concept that exists in human consciousness mm. that we all share. Mm. There's one consciousness that we share. Mm. We make up our own little individual packages, mm. but it's floating around out there, fear that there are diseases that we can't escape from, that we're gonna get them. Mm. All right, that's what drives it. Mm -hmm. And so all these other things follow from that. The current one is the same story. Mm -hmm. It's a fear that you can't do anything about it. Why is it that doctors won't look at things like proper nutrition, mm -hmm. um, you know, organic foods, preventing environmental contamination, right? That kind of stuff. Why do they never look at that stuff? Mm -hmm. They just ignore it, mm -hmm. you see? But again, doctors, as they're trained in medicine, medicine in our country, in the U.S., is a monopoly. A lot of people don't realize that. In other countries, there are other choices. In this country, it's a monopoly. Enough, Susan? No, I was just saying, you might mention the idea of the genus Epidemicus. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, it's been found in homeopathy that when an epidemic occurs, that there's a particular, shall we say, kind of a nature or identity to the disease. That, and you can find out, there's usually one, maybe two homeopathic remedies that, that can resolve it in almost everybody. There are some few exceptions here and there, but that, that's the idea. And so what you do is you, um, you take maybe 20 people that are sick and get all their symptoms, combine them into one package, and you find the remedy that fits that package. And then you start take, giving that to everybody that gets sick or as a preventive, and it's really amazingly effective. It was so effective, homeopathy was so effective in epidemics using this method. That's why it's spread all over the world. I have a whole other presentation I do on epidemics in the U.S. and how homeopathy was so effective in them. So that's why so many doctors took it on. And there's been some reports, hasn't there, that certain remedies like Nux vomica yeah. be effective. So I have found Nux vomica, the homeopathic remedy Nux vomica is the one that seems to be working almost everybody. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I want to go back to what I was saying a moment ago. The doctors, you know, that represent the medical system, the conventional medical system, uh, the allopathic system, their viewpoint is very limited. Mm. And they don't really think very much about things like removing susceptibility and preventing health problems and so on through other measures. They might talk about an, a chemical. Mm -hmm. They don't even like nutrients. Have you mm -hmm. noticed that? They don't even like nutrients. Mm -hmm. Why? Why would, you, why would you have that attitude? Well, it's interesting because I've read the hist I've gone back and read the history of medicine, and it's interesting that it comes from an again an unconscious examined assumption from long ago that they they were opposed to what was being done with herbs and and nutrients and things outside of their province, mm -hmm. mostly by women, mm -hmm. and so they fought the women. Some of them got burned, as you know, and because they were and so. So allopathic medicine has ever since then been opposed to use of herbs and pretty much opposed to use of nutrition. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions, we know. There are some doctors that are exceptions. 
But that's the general attitude, mm -hmm. right? You follow me? They just don't want to look at it. Well, there are also things you can't patent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can't patent it either. Mm -hmm. But you know, <clears throat> for example, <clears throat> environmental contamination now is so severe, the babies now are being born have been measured having over 300 chemicals in their body, some of which are carcinogens. Mm. This is average. Mm. Why don't doctors pay attention to that? Mm. Nobody cares about it. I've never found any doctor that cares about it. Because in the school, it's <coughs> what they've been taught. Yes. And it seems like a lot of the naturopaths now, there's like a new breed of naturopaths uh -huh. in the past 20 years that are being more and more AMA mm -hmm. with prescribed. They are. Yes, because been. some of my, I have a friend who is a new naturopath in 20 years. And some of the things that she suggests for her patients to do is because of what she learned in school since 2000. Right. And from her colleagues. And it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, and I just. Oh. Well, they want the naturopathic doctors, uh, the, the, the profession wants to move towards acceptance. Mm -hmm. And the more it becomes like the conventional doctors, the more it's accepted. Maybe they'll even start to get health insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who knows? You see? Mm -hmm. More money states, yeah. they have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but some. To give them a prescription pad yeah. was crazy. Yes. All of a sudden they said, oh, you can buy a prescription for a new drug. They're not even trained for drugs. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they are. I think they should. They, now, well, they are. Now, but they will But still, they will. Yeah. So I want to just finish up here. I want to just finish what I was saying about the way I view it, for whatever it's worth. The underlying thing is um, a, an attitude of fear and, and vulnerability and victimization that goes back 200 years or more. It's continued on in our human consciousness. We have never addressed it seriously. And <clears throat> the, the, all of these, to my, in my opinion... And mind you, I came from, my, my, I did my PhD program in immunology and I was totally convinced of the value of vaccines and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I have a to totally opposite view now that I think that the, what has to happen if we're really going to take a more correct path is that we as a culture and as a medical system have to ad finally admit to ourselves that this pro type of approach does not work. Mm -hmm. That's it. Stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Start looking at ways we can promote health, intelligent things that can prevent the spread, right? And, and, what and other methods of treatment, like homeopathy and so on. In your estimation, what are the chances of that happening? I don't see it happening. No. But I don't know, 100 years from now, maybe? Huh? There's too many people brainwashed with television. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 like a, it's a it's a cultural myth. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural myth. It's like a religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the vested in interests mm -hmm. of those who are running the oh, show. Oh my gosh! Yeah, think of the money. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's just money. I think people really are afraid. Right. That's they, the thing that drives you. Think of all the people who want to wear masks because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. they're, they, you know. So I understand. It's a terrible looking disease. Who wants to look like that? <laughs> I'm just saying we have to admit. <clears throat> It's got, maybe an analogy would be like, let's say we have an ongoing social conflict because of our, say, our racial attitudes and prejudice. Mm -hmm. All right? It goes on generation after generation in different forms. Is there any other solution than uh, at some point facing that and dropping it? Mm -hmm. There's no other way you're going to solve it. Mm -hmm. In the same way, we're going to have to stop promoting and doing these things, I think, and look for other solutions. Because as long as we think this is a solution, we won't look. That's not it. So I don't know. Give me your feedback. Do you think it was worth seeing? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. totally. Yeah. I want to see the next one, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, question. the one that you were talking about on, um, that you had, that you'd already done. Which one? Could you mention at the end that you... Oh, about epidemics? About it, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're interesting. If you ever want to hear about it, it's about epidemics. It's more based on homeopathy, but it, it talks about epidemics in the United States and how homeopathy was effective in treating them. It's, it's, it's still kind of like this. It's interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, if, if you have interest in that sometime. We'll see how, how the feedback is on that. So I guess that's it, if, unless you have other questions.
Uh, that's all I have to really give you. I, I do have some stuff here, as I said, I could read. Uh, when did we get our 20 decks for listening to you? <laughs> 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 do you have that on a, um, that you can email that out? Uh, probably, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I'd like to see yeah. it there. Yeah, it's pretty much what I showed you here. It's just some other sources like that. I thought maybe I'd read it, but I, th I think you've had enough. So, okay, cool. Thank you very much for your attention.